Uh, welcome to the Stanley Street Social Podcast, Shay Brown. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So you're on a cycling podcast now. I assume this is your first one. <laughs> first cycling podcast? Yes, how, absolutely. How did an ex-netballer end up on the bike? Well, funny story. Last year for the first Pucker Up bike ride, I was um, advising Wayne Schwoss, the founder, um, on his business model and helping him with the bike ride, getting it off the ground. It's something that I'm, the, the cause is something that I'm very um, passionate about spreading. So I was, um, and after the last bike ride, we had a review and I got up on my high horse and I said, you can't be having two female riders out of 40 on your bike ride, it's not on. And he said, righto, and threw me a kit <laughs> <laughs> and said, well, I'll sign you up for next year. So I had to sort of be true to my word. And um, when I retired from netball in August last year, there was sort of no excuses after that. So, yeah. So before that, no riding? Just Oh, I'd been on my commuter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we, um, did you ride a bike as a, a kid? No. Nah. Not no. really, like, oh, just as any kid would. But, um, yeah, like, I was – I grew up being, a, like, into every sport under the sun. Yeah. We absolutely loved – I was like, cricket, footy, swimming, triathlon. Um, when I say triathlon, it was, like, wheat bix. Yeah. <laughs> Still. <laughs> Still on my little um, mountain bike. But, yeah, that was pretty much the extent of, um, of that part. And, and, yeah, now I'm – now I'm on a bike. When, when did netball become the main goal or like the, the direction? Um, so I started playing professionally when I, I got my first contract when I was 15 years old. Um, so, so you're, I was pretty a, you're young. a superstar. Uh, I was touted with potential. So I was not, I was like in the third side at the time and I was like this gangly <laughs> girl that really didn't have much idea of what it was doing but I was also playing tennis at a quite a high level at the same time and I was sort of tapped on the shoulder right place right time sort of situation and they said oh you should come down and and train with the Melbourne Kestrels and I said I didn't even know you could do anything professionally at that age I was just having fun and um yeah from there it really became my rock I really loved um the discipline and and the team camaraderie of being in a in a team sport and um yeah, realised that I could make a little bit of a living out of it as well. Where, where was the sport at at that time? Oh, like <laughs> when you say professionally, it's more like <laughs> have a couple of thousand dollars for the season. Um, we have grown the sport exponentially since then. So that was what, 15 years ago. Mm. Um, we signed up, like we literally signed on for a thousand dollars a year and then like every game would be... That was- your yeah, wage. Your wage. And then you get $100 per game. So don't spend it all at once. It was, <laughs> pretty, um, it was pretty horrific. But um, we started – and we thought that was awesome, by the way. Like we were just absolutely stoked. And I think that's really po- in a really important part of playing sport is that you're always doing it for the passion. I don't think that, if, that dollar signs is something you should ever be um, doing it for and um, or at least it will allow you to enjoy it. But as the as with the sport evolved, by the end of it, all of us were making a fairly good living out of playing netball. So I saw the worst of times and the best of times, and I have to say there was somewhere in between that was probably the best part of it because um, as soon as you do put um, this, like, and I think AFLW is going to have this sort of same sort of evolution where you you are just so passionate about the sport that you play, but then suddenly there's all these different angles you have to start to consider the branding um the personal branding mm. people are starting to do and this whole idea of um being more than just the sport i think that that um is an evolution that we're going to see in in a number of different female sports yeah well, it was interesting because i never turned pro but i was in the under 23 amateur scene yeah. and a lot of my mates have gone pro and it was like we were just six boys just Earning no money, yeah, hanging around sport was unreal. And then some yeah. of them talk about it, it's like that was the best time ever. Totally. And compared to now, they're actually earning cash. It's yeah. like, what's better? What, would what? You, can you see something in netball that cha- like what changed it? What, what kind of spurred on that growth? Um, well, there was definitely a broadcast opportunities, sponsorship opportunities. There was definitely a new appetite for commercial deals in female sport. Um, netball being the most progressed in yeah developing athletes 
there, we had a, a really, really strong product. Um, but the, the, we didn't care. And like to your point, back in those days, we just were all about getting wins on the board, having fun together. Um, you know, we used to take a microwave on tour, like on our interstate games because that's all we could afford. Mm. <laughs> Two minute noodles were carbo loading. And yeah, that was just, that's just how it was, but we loved it. It was really, really fun. Um, and now the, you know, it, your priorities and motivations and intentions for what you're doing change over time. So, mm. um, and a, as soon as you inject that um, new, in, new motivation of like, it's your living. So of course, it's, it costs so much more <laughs> to not be playing the sport. Um, the way I sort of look at it, though, is that sometimes you really got to think about if you're not playing for the love of it, um, it, the love of it's really the only sustainable thing. I think that, you know, poor form, um, injuries, um, politics of sport – they're all sort of outside of your control at times. And so the, the thing that you can control is enjoying all the bits about why you started in the first place. Um, and I think that that if you are trying to make a living out of sport, that there is a time pressure on that. And that as soon as it's over, I've seen it firsthand where there's been a number of different um, you know, mental health considerations, all the things that when those when you take a really disciplined, ambitious person away from the goal or change the goal or the goal is no longer there, you can it really can displace people in a really scary way. Do you remember when it changed for you? When it went from like, all right, I've got a little bit of cash, I'm doing the sport I love to, oh, this is a job? Yeah, totally. So I, when I was, so when I was talking about that first contract, um, I didn't even know that it was a thing. So I was just like playing and having fun and I was just so happy to be there. And then, you know, in my early, like couple of seasons in, that started to be, I started to put more pressure on myself and I started to become this extremely selfish brat-like athlete <laughs> that was just all about me. All I wanted was to be the best player I could be. So it had moved from being like having fun with my teammates to what can I do? to be the best and what age that was probably about 19 20 and I just I moved my life to Perth like I got a new contract over to WA and it was a good contract and um like things were good and I thought well I've tried this hard and I got this much result so if I try doubly hard then I'll get even better results but um as soon as you start to put those pressure and and as soon as you start to debalance your life um those results don't come in the same increments and um yeah I got to a point where I was sort of not um I wasn't getting the results that I thought I was putting that I deserved and mm. um, <laughs> and yeah I remember there was this like real big tipping point where I just went what like is this even worth it what, what am I doing this for and um, was borderline about to quit and that's when I thought hmm I'll just make really pretty sports bras that was <laughs> <laughs> and that launched my um my business career which um you know that was supposed to be the transitional thing like well if I start something else at least I'll have something to go into so I started my business once upon a run um when I was 20 ish I can't remember um and that was as this, soon as I started this pre Lululemon like yes pre kind of. it's pre active wear bonanza yeah. <laughs> um so yeah it was and I just saw a gap in the market I just thought that there has got to be more to like I love feeling good in what I wear when I go out for a run or go to training like it's look good feel good play good is the motto that I was sort of trying to streamline and so I went off and went to Indonesia and we built a factory and we did all these like awesome things to get it um to, to get it off the ground. I was still playing netball. Still no, that? I was still playing netball. And I was, but the funny thing was that as soon as I started to have something else in my life, I realized that I realized that I actually 
netball was benef- benefiting from this. Like it was slow at first and then next minute, like I was going out and I was playing like a free woman. I just, I didn't have that pressure on myself. It was all about the love of it again. And that's something that I think is so, imp- like that's what it taught me the most was that, yeah, that it, like we can, as athletes, we can be brainwashed into thinking you have to be thinking, breathing, eating the sport that you play at a professional level all the time. Whereas I'm convinced and I've seen it time and time again with all the athletes that I'm still, I still work with and still um, are friends with as well, that the times that they start to lose sight of who they are away from their sport, when they, as soon as they start identifying as Shay, just the netballer, or the netballer, then that's when you start to see that their performance starts to slip as well. Mm. Um, whereas if you start to have a better understanding of who you are away from your sport, your sport benefits. Is that it, like a, a netball culture now? Or because I still think cycling is very like this is what you do, and like if you do something else, you're crazy. Um, like one shot, this is the one direction. Is netball like that, or is it a bit more, I guess, considered in the whole life approach definitely not that's definitely um me (laughs) (laughs) and i've been waving that flag for a really long time and not very many people will listen because there is more money involved there's more um opportunities for people to be um to be making a, a fair income living out of their sport and that's not something to take lightly um and yeah so i i think that that's there's a long way to go to be able to achieve that balance. Um, mm. And yeah, I'm not sure. Like, I like, and it is up to the athlete as well. Like, some athletes, it works better that they just need to be who they are. But what I see is that it's okay to identify yourself as something. That's fine. But what if that thing gets taken away from you at any moment in your life? What happens then? And that, that's the bit where I'm like, no one cares about you then. No one's going to be helping you pick up the pieces because you're not actually a key to them achieving the premiership or achieving the the next gold medal or you're not a part of that anymore. And as much as they try to sell you that, oh, yeah, no, we take care of you post your career, I just don't think mm, that that's everyone something. Takes everyone takes care of you. Yeah, everyone says the words, but what does that actually mean? Um, I, and to me, like my like the, the holistic view of who I am as a person and who my family is and is way more important. Yeah. Mm. Can you remember something that sparked that like, all right, I need to go find something else? So I assume before that you were just all in Nepal? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I'm not quite sure exactly what sparked it. It was probably maturity. Um, I, pu- I was in the system for 15 years, which is a pretty long time. Um, so I saw the ebbs and flows of it. And I saw, you know, I saw, I saw the young guns chomping at the bit just to get a game. And I saw the older girls just understand the system a little bit better and, and use their experience to their advantage. And I saw everything in between. And, um, yeah, I just think over time I just realised um, – there's probably the other thing was watching my husband retire from AFL footy. So he retired um, in circumstances that were totally out of his control. And it was, he had a pretty, like his career looked to be set for at least another two or three years. Um, but due to, due to circumstances, he next minute was totally without a contract and left him in a, like, you know, a l- in limbo um, mm. and he's like one of the most disciplined goal orientated person people I know and yeah f- watching him have to struggle through that and try and find who he was as a person um, who was actually way more like it was I, I believe that he's found something that's so much more than him as a footballer and it's it's enriched his life more than that could ever have yeah like i guess um one thing i a lot of people struggle with is what to do like it's like oh mm-hmm. i don't know what to do i've mm-hmm. this is all i know this is all i've done yeah how did you f- work out what you wanted to do how did he or yeah. you or yeah. Yeah. yeah um well i think if it goes down to uh, it's how i operate is it's all through your values like you have to really do a bit of soul searching to realize what you actually like what what are the values that made you love the sport you played or what are the things that you think about when you're not playing that sport that mean something to you 
And when you start to really be able to identify what they are, not just the feelings associated with them, but like what is it that is actually making you love something or hate something, like being able to articulate that and then try and understand what are the activities around that. That's sort of how I found cycling. Like I know cycling sort of found me and then I started just riding with Pucker Up, but I love being in nature. Like that's really important to me. I love working hard and pushing myself <laughs> <laughs> that's really important to me and and I love being in a social environment and you know there's all these different elements that help you go oh well it's okay just because netball is the thing that you did doesn't mean it's the thing that you are but there are elements of that thing that can be applied to so many different parts of your life and that's what I'm doing in my, my job now as well is like I can't believe how much crossover there is between netball and investing in startup businesses. <laughs> yeah. um, and I can't believe how much crossover there is in startup businesses and working with businesses and working with my family. And there's just patterns are everywhere. And I love matching those patterns. And I think that if we did that better, we'd actually be a lot more at peace with who we are. So it was the pattern to start your own business that drive that competitive nature? Totally. Yeah. Just the having a goal, like getting something off the ground, doing it, making it happen. That's just that's so in my nature is is and that's important to me is just um and I love like the thrill of the journey, like the you know, it does it has a goal at the end because at least it gives you a direction to go in. Mm. But my favourite bit is the hard work that comes in between and, and again, another analogy for cycling. <laughs> yeah. I remember being like the first, like that day at Hotham on the Pucker Up bike ride, like that I loved every moment but hated every moment. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's something that that's how I approach everything I do. And the having the bit, like having a business is a bit different to doing it. Uh, part-time business degree or something at uni or doing a, yeah. something small like how did that how did you go managing that and a pro career at the same time oh just making heaps of mistakes um <laughs> <laughs> and just and but not letting that um deter me it was really just about I had a lot of support like um, my husband helped me and um I think the discipline of being an athlete made you realize what like you you yeah, it's as I said, like there's just so many crossovers. So mm. it really was, it really did help. Um, yeah. 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 And then heading towards the end of your career. Yeah. When, when did that start to click that it was like, oh, probably I'm ready to pack up? Yeah, um, it happened pretty, pretty organically. Um, I was very lucky in that it wasn't, it was up to me. I was sort of in, in that place where I felt like I'd had a really great career and I was in good form and, um, and yeah, but I was, I was having a lot of um, opportunities at work that I was having to say no to and because of sport and I was edging on 30 um, and thinking, well, maybe it's time at this point where I like, I love the job that I do. Like I've loved everything about it and it's become a this major is part of my life. This current job or at your no, my previous job? No, current job. job. Yeah. 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 And, um, so that those opportunities were just, um, it painted a pretty good post netball picture for me and I thought, well, why not wait? Um, I think now's the time. Yeah. Yeah. And was that easy or was was that like a long process or was it a right no, this I is think it. it's like a it was a if you know you know sort of situation and then you woke up like the next day after with a job still was there any kind of transition period or was it just bang straight into work um i've been thinking about transition for such a long time for other people and something that i'm really been like i've like spoken already quite a bit about but um yeah i just i i I just had I wanted to always be in control of that I really wanted to know what I was doing the next day and I wanted to and so my transition started three years before I retired I knew that um, my business was going well but it wasn't the thing I was going to do forever um, I was really really fortunate to meet my now boss 
in a mentoring capacity at that time as well. And he was giving me a lot of advice around growing my business, but also the opportunities that ha- that were with his business. And at one point he invited me in and said, this might be something that could be um, good for you in the long run. And I was like, and I had no idea what we were doing, but I just, I, it felt right. And um, at that time I knew that I, I wanted to have more, more elements of me. Mm. So, yeah, so I started working full time um, in at Pan with two years left in my career. Yeah. Yeah. So I was running crazily from training. I had to live like right in the heart of everything just so that I could manage um, going to training, being at training at 6 a.m., getting to work by 9.30 and then checking out again at t- at four to get to tr- back to training, and then <laughs> repeating <laughs> every day. And you still think your performance didn't go backwards because no. of that? No. It would have been better doing that than just being a straight netballer. For me, yes, because my mind needs to be taken off the sport. I'm uh, I I'm very like I if like I'm I can be quite obsessive, so I can I need to be distracted. So. Um, I, the time there was only one season I've ever played that I didn't have anything going on outside of netball and it was my worst season by far. And so, but you kind of had a perfect career in a way. You controlled how long it went for, it finished oh, up when you wanted. to some people, right? So I think that that's a really interesting concept because I was probably had one of the worst careers in any netballer's history. If you, like I didn't win any premierships. Um, I was in a side that um, didn't, we only played finals a few times. That You know, like if you were to mm, measure it yeah, in okay. like other ways, people would be like, oh yeah, fairly average netballer. But to me, like it was... I, I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> like it was, I don't know, my, like su- success for me was just being in a team I loved, playing with people that I adored, um, playing a leadership role when I needed to, um, working hard, swimming in the same direction as other people. Um, and I think the longevity of my career was something that I'm really, really proud of and the relationships that I've managed to build in the process as well. Yeah. So heading back to the start, is there something – like I guess or even a piece of advice for someone that's at that kind of 16 to 20 year old point where it's like all right I've got a talent in this sport what do I do yep um there's so many people with talent yeah so I actually am quite realistic about this I think that um you know you've got to be actually I don't think the most talented it's like like, totally but I don't think the most talented people often make it I think it's the ones that work the hardest that um, that understand the commitment they have to make and the discipline that it takes, especially in those early days. Um, but if you are not having fun at the same time, then it's one, just not worth it. Um, and two, I don't think that it w- will last, that it will, it will be short-lived. Mm. Within that time from you having your $1,000 contract to becoming a full-time thing, mm-hmm. is that when the transition like social media became a thing, kind of that personal branding element yep. came into things? Yep. How did you go managing that? Yeah, I bought into it a lot early um, and as we all did, I think. Um, but when I started to paint a, um, or when I saw that people were painting pictures that were just – um, very shallow and just like top level stuff. Um, like I, I just thought, where is the authenticity? And mm. I think that that's something that has been missing for a while. And I feel like we're starting to realize the value of really great storytelling. It's one of the main, one. It's one of the most amazing things about Parker Up as well is that we're telling real stories about um, what it actually means to be human and, and that we're not trying to paint any pretty pictures but we're normalising and um, the um, conversation around mental health and we're destigmatizing the fact that it's um, that, that, that sometimes, you know, you're not okay and mm. that's okay. <laughs> I guess... Like kind of men's cycling is kind of in a, it's a bit of a plateau. It's kind of mm. there. It's big. It's probably going backwards if anyone asks okay. how the sport's going. But female cycling is has been tiny and it's really yeah. starting to get some traction. 
Amazing. Which yeah, I imagine is similar to where you were with netball when it first started. Yeah. Um, participation's up. The professional ranks is yeah. kind of establishing a – you can actually earn a wage now. Mm-hmm. Um, have you got any kind of messages or advice around if you're in that phase that – Yep. moving towards, all right, this is going to be, could be a job for me. Yep. Um, I'd be selective on the sponsors that you bring on board, making sure that they're authentic to who you are as a person. I've seen so many times where as the, um, as the girls, you know, they'll throw in all these different types of endorsements and contracts and in things that they didn't necessarily believe in. And then next minute they were um, ambassadors for, um, for these brands and I think if you can if you can learn to tell your story and realize what your story actually is then mm. you'll be better off um, because you don't want to be um, yeah tied down to things that you don't um, you don't believe in that's something that I've like and because the the commitment it takes to keep these brands happy is actually pretty pretty huge so I think like as a young as a young cyclist coming into it try and work out like how do you want to tell your story think about it really carefully and how is it different to the girl beside you and is it real um and work with brands to tell that because they want that too trust like like it's um it's really important um these days like we want we want to see that that realness um that would be one thing um can you articulate your story? My story? Yeah. Um, like if you were going to sponsor, say you were still pro. Yeah. Um, I, I thought about this a little bit because I knew that I wanted to participate in social media, but I didn't know how because I didn't really want – like I've always been the type of person that likes to ref, like tell other people's stories. Mm. And then that links to my love of team. So I always was thinking that my story is – my family story like it's it's like sort of reversing the selfie and saying like sort of um like yeah being able to say these are the people in my life these are the people that enrich my life every day and um and yeah being able to sort of share those experiences I think would be um like for me team is everything it's the reason I do do it like whether it's sport or business or my work, family, the people around me are, are, are the things I care about the most. Yeah. Very good. And in terms of anything else in that kind of that personal branding, you're still trying to fit into a team, the sport's yeah. growing, the money's coming into it, yeah. there's a little bit more pressure on your shoulders. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess um, to, just to make sure that you're – like I think as well, it's really important as a young athlete to realize what makes you tick. Like it took me a really long time to realize that I didn't. There's some elements of the program that didn't work for me, um, and so that that um, led to like injuries or poor form or um, other crappy bits. But um, the faster you can learn about who you are as a athlete physically, emotionally, mentally, all of the bits, I think is the better. Um, Because I think sometimes it can be brainwashed into thinking there's a cookie cutter type of athlete. There's, that is, that, that's the girl that everyone, um, everyone should fit into that bit. And that's what it looks like. But I don't think that that's the case. I think that there's lots of different ways that an athlete can look. Um, And being able to sort of have the initiative and the balls to just be like, this is the type of athlete I am. Ash Brazel is probably like the most, um, the best example of that. She's someone that didn't, um, for, she's probably one of the most incredible athletes. She's one of my best mates, but one of the most incredible athletes I've ever been, had the privilege of playing with. And for some reason she just didn't make the teams that you thought she should have. And, um, now she's she, but she just followed w- her, and she just kept doing her, um, and she's probably she's been the most authentic to the type of person she is, as well as the type of athlete she is. And now she's a dual athlete in AFLW and netball, and just killing it at life. And I think that that's just such a great example of someone that just like embraced her individualness. Mm. Sorry. 
you got the call up from Swatter to do the puck rut ride. <laughs> where, where on earth did you start? We're on the bike. Yeah. Oh my goodness. See, see, this is where we can go with this conversation. I am still th- like th- the butt of all jokes every time we get on the bike because I have no idea what we are doing on the puck rut bike ride. They were just every. I didn't know about kits. I didn't know about chamois cream. I didn't know about like not wearing undies under your lycra. <laughs> like I didn't know what a um, <laughs> every it, they'd all take photos of the grease marks on my legs, yeah. tramp stamps, and I'm just I'm learning as we go, but I'm having a ball with it anyway, and I'm sort of taking taking it as it comes. I don't mind. Um, I love being new to it because how long did you have from when you? Like, did you go buy a bike? Like, how, where, how did you get all your equipment? And yeah, Giant South Yarra, um, they helped me out and they, yeah. so they got me on a bike. Yeah. Um, just before Christmas, um, I went on my first bike ride. Fell off like Where'd four you? times. Oh, no. Just trying to clip in and out, <laughs> that old chestnut. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I just started, like, going up and down my street. <laughs> And then, um, and then, yeah, we. I started doing. Um, I think that I did two pack rides or something like that before the ride, and um, I was so nervous at the back because there was just uh, like I didn't know the etiquette. Like I had no idea what we were doing, and I look back at those first few rides and think, oh my goodness, I've, <laughs> I've like broken every cycling rule there is. Um, yeah, but that's okay. <laughs> And the the ride itself, yeah, because it's not exactly an easy ride. It's not like no. a, a small little charity ride. Yeah. Like how many k's did you do that week? We did like eighteen hundred. Yeah. yeah, over ten days and did a fair few mountains at the same time. Yeah. And um, I'm like one of the most competitive people. Um, yeah, really competitive. And so I remember like because we'd all pack ride and then um, we'd break off when we'd go up hills and stuff like everyone just do their own pace mm-hmm. and there was like the boys at the front and I was just like oh yeah you reckon you can, all right and I'd just like hang on and then like there'd, there'd be this little battle going on I'd just sort of be like creeping at the back <laughs> like just hanging on for dear life and then um the, we'd get to like the top and then all all the boys were like yeah. and they'd be like well done boys I'm like I'm a girl <laughs> <laughs> so I just yeah, it was very competitive when it came to um yeah, setting up for the minor. And and you must be pretty fit now if you've conquered that week. Like cycling fit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah. I felt fine. Like the first few days I was sore and then by I think your body just must adapt because yeah, but and I think everyone was a little bit like that as well. Yeah. Like it was hard. It was really hard, but it was um like your body adapts. What about the emotional aspect of the ride? Because yeah. it's not exactly every day just, oh, I'm just going to go to a thousand Ks. It's Well, like, all right, like, um, then compound that with the fact that we're talking about a really heavy topic where we're trying to start conversations around suicide prevention. So we're going into towns and we're speaking to people that have been, I don't know how much you know about it, but rural Victoria has been affected um, horrifically by suicide um, and... You, know, you couldn't roll into a town without um, um, families, townspeople, everyone wanting to be involved in this conversation. People that had been affected directly or indirectly. So then you go out riding. So you're physically spent. You're emotionally spent. It was the absolute epitome of being broken down. Um, but it was like ridiculously hard but the the most ridiculously satisfying thing at the same time yeah so we're because we had swatter on the podcast last year before he yeah or just after he did it yeah and we got another check in with him in a month or so when he's yeah. finally free yeah like where where are they at with both the pucker up and their mental health objective uh, it, it's just the movement's growing and it's been um it's it's just been absolutely inspiring to see how how well the message has been picked up and just how quickly people want to start these conversations it's like as soon as you take away the um or as soon as you create safety around the conversation it's unbelievable the things that um, people want to talk about and and starting that conversation with their family and friends and um, I think it's it's doing 
incredible work and um, I'm really proud to be an ambassador of Packer Up. Um, the yeah, the, I, I remember the, there was one in Wangaratta and unfortunately um, Shwada couldn't make that particular forum. And so um, it was Scotty Cummings, myself, Ryan O'Keefe and Michael, um, Mick, the, Mick the Packer Up Trucker. Um, we went down to the park and, and invited the entire town in and we all told our, our own stories and started to just tell them that it's like, it's, this is a safe space. Like we want you guys to, if, if there's anyone that wants to speak and or has something to say, and there was these, you know, you could tell by the body language, the body language started with like these blokes sort of just like sitting back and, and didn't want to bar of what he had to say, just was had that big stoic, manly um i don't talk about my feelings face on to over a period of time really starting to lean in to the point of some of them even putting their hand hand up and saying i've never spoken about this before but um i've yeah i've been affected in this way it affects my family and and um you know i've thought about taking my life and and you know these really and it 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 was i can't even describe it it's pretty incredible and then to be able to make sure we we found support for these people um yeah i think it's is there something in particular about it that's working so like that's clicking with people um i think it's the storytelling part of it i think that um you know mental health has been such a clinical um there's been such a clinical approach to it for such a long time whereas what pucker up is doing is is we're starting a conversation that is is more natural it's it's making it be a part of what we do um normally and it's you know it's normalizing it and that that having lived experiences and real life stories um you know just make it um that much more approachable a subject and i think that that's the bit that is the key to the clinical bit like it, it you need both like you need the storytelling and you need the clinical and i think that we're opening the gates to that clinical bit yeah. um, and so that's why we've got a partnership with saint saint vincent's hospital and we've created the be to the power of you bu program which goes into corporate workplaces and and begins like a, a transformational experience where it's um it's combining the the power of storytelling with um, facilitators that are clinically trained to be able to move you from that engaging in the conversation to then being equipped with the skill sets to be able to deal with the, um, the with your own mental health, taking agency over your own mental health. Have you got um, a lot of friends retiring now? The last few years, yeah. How, yeah. Have you? Have they all su- kind of? I guess succeeded. Like you have, like well, found I that think- next. Yeah, I think there's um, – everyone gets there. It's a matter of time. Um, I, like, I think that some people retire and they're actually okay for the first six months because they're just sort of like, I love having all this spare time and body doesn't hurt and there's all these great things about not being um, an athlete anymore. And then it sort of – it might hit them round one where the games start being played again or – um, whatever, and or the team might win a premiership without you, or that you know, there's like little triggers that might um, undo people at certain points. But um, yeah, no, I think that there's actually a really, really big issue with um, mental health and athletes. I think there's a lot of, um, I think it could be dealt with better. I mean, like it really frustrates me when you you can drive past any of the footy ovals where AFL clubs are training like this is AFL plenty of money <laughs> to spend on on resources and there might be one guy going over cones doing rehab for an injury and there's six coaches looking at him like doing his little knee injury prevention things they've got six people there looking after him physically and most clubs don't have the actual support they need emotionally and i just think if you fix your head your body will follow i promise Mm. but people just don't put that same because you can't see it it's less tangible so that they don't people aren't willing to put that resource into um fixing your head before the body um and i think though that that that's changing and that's what pucker up speaking to is people are seeing that need and they're they're looking for um solutions yeah and have you got have you seen something that works like i guess if you haven't done that prep 
beforehand you haven't got something ready to go yeah. is there something that works to go all right it's just mm, that's because yeah i think it's a really hard one because everyone's so because cycling is, cycling yeah. is exact, exact exactly same. the same it's like disregard mental health but performance yeah. i'll give you every single tiny little minute thing yeah. down to the and well, whatever um, it costs i'll pay yeah. for it well i'm starting a new um bike crew calling um ballers that bike so all of my ex-athlete friends that are getting off the netball court can transition nicely onto a bike it's very friendly for netballers yeah. because it's taking the pressure off the knees which is so you've gone from not riding a few months ago to starting bike oh yeah yeah, now. yeah yeah i'm okay, all about good. it i'm like good. full cyclist now um yeah but it's i think it is finding something to like i think it's really important that athletes that don't stay active initially i think that's one of the keys is like don't just go from zero from 100 to zero to zero um because I, I like the 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 health um both physically and mental of staying active is just like people, this you just got to do it mm. <laughs> um which i like cycling's tick that box for me um and then it's a matter of finding like you know, there's different elements of finding work. Like financially, you might need to find work. There's um, um, having a goal that might be the reason, whatever the reasons are, like try and work out exactly where you need to go and ask for help. There's such a big community of athletes that are um, that have gone through it, have gone through it, and they can empathise like nothing else. Like I know Mitch, my, my husband, who's he retired, that's all he wants to do is like any time he sees an athlete either have an injury or get delisted or retire, he just wants to like ring him up and be like, all right, let's go for a coffee. What do you need? Like, um, and start chatting to these people. There's people, they, like, we get it. And um, I think, yeah, it's it's important that find, yeah, find, um, find your peers, lean on them. They want to help. Thanks, Shay. No worries. That was fantastic. Thanks for having me. No worries.